And now a clip from the desk of the apostle. This scripture is very familiar. And when the Lord gave it to me, I said, but Lord, you have used me to minister this years ago on television. There's a VHS tape called The Lord Uses Apostle Coleman to Examine John Chapter 4. And when the Lord used me to say or label a DVD or a program that he uses me to examine something, that means to pay close attention to detail, to watch what the Lord is saying in the text and to serve it in the correct context. Otherwise, I'd be twisting scripture. And none of us in ministry should do that. The only thing worse than twisting scripture is not living what you preach. In this text, there's so much meat in different verses and those of you that are in ministry you know that you can read something over and over and over under the anointing when the holy ghost say read and you will see things that you didn't see before or you'll notice something that you didn't know before and part of the reason is because of season It's not the season. Okay. Let's. Because there's so many ways as you read this that you can go. One key thing it's important to notice is John chapter 4 verse 4. And he must. Needs. Go through Samaria. Now, those of you that are Bible students and scholars and teachers, it's important to pay attention to the geography of Scripture. Preachers, you might get lost in this, but you'll get excited later. But teachers, you're going to be informed. And students and those that study and want to learn that are not in ministry for fame, prestige, power, recognition but that in ministry because you were called in charge to go and make disciples for Jesus Christ you're going to be informed and I, I know and pray that this inspires you that you see something else out of here and the Lord use you to minister that for the copycats, for those that are looking and watching and say, oh, I think I'm going to try to minister that word. I haven't even given you the title yet, uh, but I'm going to minister that word. No, you ain't going to be able to do it because when God calls you to do something, no one can do what you do. And when you're living it, the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost moves through you and through the teaching. Glory. He must, he must, he must needs, needs, go through Samaria. Verse 3, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. But to get to Galilee from Judea, he had to go through Samaria. <laughs> As he went through Samaria, verse 5, he, went, he came to a city, which is called Sychar. And one of the landmarks here, it was near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Verse 6 says, Jacob's well was there. Mm -hmm. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well 
end, it was about the sixth hour. So we're talking between 9 a.m. to noon. Because the Jews' day was divided into two parts at four-hour periods. Four, four-hour periods. Okay? Four, four-hour periods. It started in the evening at sunset and ended at sunset. Those of you that study scripture in the book of Genesis, it says, and the evening and the morning was the first day. He therefore, verse 6, being wearied with his journey. Now there's, there's a problem here that it's important to notice. And it's for this woman's benefit and also for ours because we get to read about it. The problem is, I thought that God does not get tired. But he said in scripture, he therefore being weary with his journey, he was tired. Now, it appears to be a problem because again, I thought God don't get tired. Yet, it turns out, I'm looking for my handkerchief, it turned out that it's really not a problem. Why? Because he allowed himself to be tired. Even though God was walking the earth in the flesh, encased in flesh, disguised in flesh, he never stopped using his godliness. He chose when to use whatever part of his godliness that he chose to use. That, my friend, is called being omnipotent. Almighty. He chose when to be tired. He chose when to be hungry. He chose when to lay his life down. He chose when to pick it back up. But right here, he chose to be tired. Verse 6. And he sat on the well. About the sixth hour. Now while he was sitting there. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now, it would look like this was a coincidence, but those of us that know God know he, nothing, 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 nothing is by coincidence. The people you meet in your life are never by coincidence. The places that you have seen or traveled or go to in your life is never by coincidence. Even your trials that you go through are not by coincidence. Your fallings, not by coincidence. Your sins are not by coincidence. Let me go up a notch for the scholars and the theologians and the teachers. But your trials are fitted for your calling. There are certain things that a prophet and a prophetess goes through that an evangelist won't. There are certain things that an apostle goes through that a pastor can't. <laughs> there are certain things that a teacher goes through that a prophet can't. Why? Because there's no hierarchy. It's not that the apostle is the head, no, Christ is the head. And there is no such thing as a chief apostle but Christ. So in the earth realm, all this chief apostle stuff, that's, that's not 
God. Not God. Not God. God. Your trials are fit for your calling. I'm going to go, I'm just going to jump way ahead right quick and then come back. And just by saying this, this woman was used by the Lord to be an evangelist. And she went to the city and told these men about Jesus Christ, but she had a bad reputation. Now I'm coming back. Hold that because we're going to dive on that. It's relevant to this talk. This woman came about the sixth hour to draw water. And because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, yet this was an appointed time for her and the Lord to meet or to do what the Hebrews call Darbar, which is what Moses did with God when it says that Moses talked with God. He Darbarred in order for Jesus to have conversation with the Samaritan woman, he had to break the ice. And all he said, give me to drink. Verse 8 says, for his disciples were going away unto the city to buy meat. Now, now, again, teachers, theologians, Bible students, let's notice something here. A revelatory truth. There's times in our life when the Lord want to talk to us, that he takes us away from people, places, and things. Some of us know how to accept that, but then there's some of us that complain and say, I don't have nobody to talk to. I don't have nobody to spend time with. I pray, but I ain't got nobody else. The Lord will let you know that during the roughest times of your life, he will remove people out of your life. He will move family members away from you. He'll tell you like he told Abraham, come out from your family. Because there's something that God want to say to you. And the family might not understand it. The friends might not understand it. That old job might not understand it. You might not understand it. But there's that time that he blocks everybody out of the arena of your trial. And he makes it so it's just you and him and if you don't understand that if you don't realize that you will miss many seasons and this is the result of the title of this talk damaged goods i was gonna look up damaged and then goods but the holy ghost said no look up damaged goods in the dictionary and the definition is a person regarded as inadequate or impaired in some way for those that don't know what inadequate means the sense a couple of synonyms though there were many but the appropriate ones for this talk are insufficient incomplete restricted if you try to use your credit card and there's not enough money up there, it will say insufficient funds, meaning you can't get what you're trying to get because your credit card is inadequate. A person regarded as inadequate or impaired. A couple of synonyms of impaired is weakened or damaged or having a disability of a specific kind. This woman 
was damaged goods. She was a good woman. As we see, she was intelligent. She knew the history of her people. She even knew how they worshipped. But she was damaged goods. Women call men of God controlling because the woman feels, well, I should be able to wear my cleavage out. Why? That's what you want to be known for? You're out of beauty? First Peter chapter 3, scripture says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. This is the truth. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Meaning the way you carry in yourself. Your conduct. A man of God, when he accepts a woman into his life, he's not looking so much at the outside of her. As a matter of fact, that's the very last thing he look at. Let me tell you something. I'm going to put my head on the chopping block. Before I got saved, I loved women. Before I got saved, I was a womanizer. Before I got saved, I was a player. And let me tell you something that a, a player won't tell you because it'll mess up their game. I'm, I'm going to blow the whistle. A man of the world, when he meets a woman, the first thing he noticed, her body. Wow, look at that. I'm going to be real with you. Look at that. Young, smooth skin, nice and shapely. Wow, look at that. Got this hanging out, that hanging out, that jiggling and moving and wiggling. Oh, my goodness, look at all that. And then he says, how can I get that? So you know what he does? He tries to appeal to her mind. Why? Well, if I appeal to her intellect, then I can get to her emotions and get her to trust me. And if she trusts me, she'll let me in and I can have her body. And then once he didn't had it enough times, now it's time to go on to somebody else. But here's the difference with a man of God. When a man of God sees a woman, after he consults God, notice the, the man of the world, he don't consult God. He just looks, wow, look at that. And he picks and go after and aims to get. That's his goal. But a man of God, the man of God seeks God. Father, where's my wife? Now, I know the scripture says, Whoso findeth the wife, findeth the good thing, and obtaineth favor from the Lord. But in the Hebrew, that word findeth don't mean to go and look. I left my money in another room. All right, I'll say it this way. Let's say, this is it's a bookmark. Let's say I'm, I'm walking by here. And, and not aware and say, oh, there go a bookmark. I found a bookmark. I wasn't looking for it. You walk down the street and you see a $5 bill, you pick it up, say, oh, I found a $5 bill. You wasn't looking for it. Findeth in the Hebrew means to cause to meet. If you got a strong, look it up. To cause to meet. It also means to meet. It also means to acquire. So if you're walking with God huh, and the Lord is blessing you and leading you to pray for a wife. Some of y'all know years ago the Lord had me write into my wife. I didn't even have one at the time. He said write to her. Write to her. Write poems to her. I'll tell you what to write and you write it. I did it. And I did it for about two years. So now when you trust God and you keep walking with him, your wife will be right in your path. God, just like how the Lord did with this well, he calls himself to be tired so he can sit down and here come the woman. 
I'm not talking about him being with the woman. What God is leading me to, dis, to, to share is how he arranges meetings. And it's because the two people are lined up with God at the time. He said, I will not withhold any good things for those that walk up right before me. Scripture says. So, brothers, your wife, you'll run into her if you keep walking with God. And, and, and woman, you will meet your husband if you keep walking with God. The Lord will bless you two to meet. Now, that right there is the hard part. Well, easy for him because nothing is impossible with God. For us, it's hard, though, because when I was waiting for it, I wasn't looking for no wife. You don't look for no wife. You go out there looking for a wife, you're going to find some stuff. I wasn't looking for one. I would never look for a wife. And I have been married more than once. What happened, Apostle? Well, we're going to see it in, in the scripture. Sometimes people say they're ready, and you could be ready. And God can bless you two to meet because y'all are lined up. But there comes a part and a time and a season in the covenant of marriage where every vow you made or intend to make, because in the Bible, engagement and marriage is the same thing. I know you don't understand it, but you got to search. You got to research it. Matthew chapter one is a good place to start. To be engaged means in the, in the Greek to be promised in marriage. The ceremony is not what considers you marriage. That, that's just a record in the land, but that's not what considers the marriage. Who considers the marriage is God. Because when he gives a man a woman, he gives her to be his wife. When he gives a woman to a man, he's given her to her husband. The ceremony is so that in vital statistics is recorded. Now, there's a lot of people that have had the ceremony that have went to vital statistics and the devil is all in their marriage. Some of them even swing. You know what swinging is. Some pimps marry their prostitute and that's their wife. Is that a holy matrimony? No. No. First Peter 3, likewise ye wise be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wise. Meaning it is not your responsibility to check him. Mm -mm. It's not your responsibility to stand face to face with him, doing all like this, going off, doing all like this. That's, that, no, no. You'll end up left. No. The man of God, let me go back to that. Thank you, Lord. The man of God, when he prays for a wife and God sends her and puts her in his path, God will say, notice her. He'll look at her. Not the outside, but he'll be looking on the inside. Wow. Look at her. Her spirit. The man Thank of God you. looks at the woman, sees her spirit first. He, the man of God, over a ministry, established in the gospel, Filled with the Holy Ghost, saved and sanctified. When God said, notice her, he said, look past the flesh, look at her spirit. What is she bringing to the table? If her spirit is right, okay, now let me look at her, her emotions. How will she love me if I love her? If I give her my heart, how she going to treat me? How will she minister to my heart? Then the third thing, is she intelligent? Can she spell? If she don't, I got her, but 
Can she spell? I, I need to know where she is. Is she able to stand across the room and I say, talk to her with my eyes? Or do I got to draw a picture for her? Where she at? So the man of God looks at her spirit first, her emotion second, her intellect third, and the last thing, if she pass all three of them, the last thing is her body. Examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Examine yourself whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own self. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? That means worthless? Spiritually? Examine you. Are you ready for marriage? Or are you damaged goods? John chapter 4. Verse 5, the woman, I mean, verse 15, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. He just told her what the water is like. If you drink this water, whoever drink it, uh, he said in verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into e everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water. That I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Sound good. Give me sound. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. You can hear a pin drop. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. Five attempts at marriage. Damaged goods. Settling for a boyfriend. Damaged goods. Women on Facebook. Other women in ministry. That say, I'm in a relationship. That's it. Just a relationship. Your boyfriend or brother, your girlfriend. That's sad. Damaged goods. You're thirsty. Whatever the Lord keep saying to you about you and your flaw. That's what he wants to deal with you about. Stop fighting God. He commended her. He said, you did well. I commend you. You were right. You told the truth. Some women say, I'm engaged. And they got no ring on their finger. He said to the woman, Go get your husband. She admitted she didn't have one. And then the Lord ministered to her about how damaged she was. Five marriages. I don't want that. Do you? So I, I learned... In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 
25. No, let's go back to 22, saith the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is what God said. For the husband is the head of the wife, not her sister, not the one claiming to be her daughter, not the husband's relatives, not friends, no one. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. No more two, but one. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And if you can't do that, you're not ready to be married in the land. Until you can prove yourself, it's not going to happen. I'm not, I'm talking in general. The Lord said, anybody. There's a lot of sisters out there been engaged for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. And you say, why you won't marry me? Check you. A man of God that's over ministry, that's dealing with people, talking to people, people dumping their problems on him. He got to hear this. He got to be in touch with God so he could be used by God to minister to them. And God rewards him so he can carry his family. And you're going to bring mess. Mm -mm. You will get fired. Kaput. The boot left. Same thing with a man. Brother, you done met the woman of God that's strong in the ministry. You done met her. You're walking with her. You're noticing her. Y'all know God put y'all together. She loves the Lord, and you want her to spend time with you more than God. Don't you know that it is her relationship with God that makes her valuable? You will lose her. Don't let her. Don't try to make her feel like she got to choose between you and God because you'll lose her. You'll lose her. You'll lose her. And once God changes someone's heart, it's a wrap. Verse 25, all oh, brothers, we ain't getting away. God said, no, you're not getting away. Ladies first, but now I'm going to get you men. He said, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Now, this ain't no building. He talking about the body of Christ and gave himself for it. Let's stop for a minute right there. When I was married the first time, God used me to teach that on television and everything. From 1996 to 2008, I didn't bit more know what that meant. I knew what it said. I understood what it said in the Greek. But the Holy Ghost, after the divorce, and I sat down to talk to him, and he said, let's talk about you. He began to minister this to me. It's a voluntary thing when you love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He volunteered to die for the body of Christ. The husband got to die for the wife. She's supposed to submit to him in all things, as it says in verse 24 and in 25, He's uh, she supposed to do this voluntarily now. You know, there's a lot of women. I ain't got to do what no man say. I, that's why you by yourself. <laughs> I ain't got to listen to him. That's why you by yourself. Got them friends that 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 want to come over your house and always cause trouble in your house, and you don't protect it. And then your husband out there in the street with somebody else, you bought it on yourself. Brothers, you neglect your wife, and she's out there getting compliments left and right, and you notice there's a change in her. Now she's hanging out more. You're neglecting her. 
You bought it on yourself, brother. You didn't abuse her. Fought her. Slapped her. Cursed her out. Caught her everything but a woman of God. And then when she left, you bought it on yourself. This was another clip from the desk of the apostle. Join us again another time for another clip. God bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.